Welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Back, and we persevered. We do have Dr. Richard Gallagher with us. We're going to do it by phone because we're not going to give up. <laughs> no way. That's right. Um, so welcome to the show, Dr. Gallagher. Thank you. My pleasure. And he's a professor. Dr. Gallagher is a professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College and a psychoanalyst on the faculty of Columbia University. You have a regular private practice and a lot of exorcists and other ministers because you help people of all different denominations will come to you to help determine if a patient is being demonically oppressed or possessed, correct? Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly uh, right. And, you know, I've had the um, privilege, I guess, of seeing an awful lot of cases. My, my uh, chairman uh, has said I've probably seen more of these cases than any other physician in the world. So what I do is I'm not an exorcist. Uh, I know you have uh, Monsignor Rossetti on soon who is an exorcist, but I tend to consult for a lot of uh, exorcists and clergy all over the world. Can you tell us the difference between a possession and oppression? Well, uh, a possession is, is very rare. Uh, but I've seen quite a few uh, because of my experience, really, with people all over the world. Uh, a possession implies that a evil spirit has taken control over the body, not, not the soul, but the body of the individual. So he, the spirit can submerge the person's consciousness and actually uh, speak openly, and I've seen that happen many times. An oppression is a lesser type of attack. Uh, terminology differs, but essentially it's a kind of attack or assault on an individual, either physically, uh, often the case, and, and sometimes sort of cognitively, I would say, by uh, affecting the person's imagination and senses. It is very different from mental illness. And, you know, anybody who really can diagnose uh, people with mental illness, um, which I've certainly been doing for many years, is going to be able to recognize the difference because the criteria for demonic attacks, for instance, for possession, are very rigorous. This is not, this is not a loosey-goosey thing. You know, I don't intuit an evil spirit. I look for particular criteria. Some of those criteria involve things like uh, the evil spirit being able to speak foreign languages or uh, exhibiting extremes of uh, strength or other movements or being able to reveal things that they would have no way of knowing. And obviously, um, you know, sometimes this involves things like speaking Latin. Sometimes it involves things like levitating. And obviously these are not things that a mentally ill person could possibly do. So uh, you begin to discern when you look at the total case that this is something very different. So what's the difference then between knowing it's mental illness and oppression versus possession? Well, again, it, you, 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 look at the total, you, you look at the total picture. And again, I think most people in the mental health field can recognize that uh, there's a, a mental disorder involved. But with oppression, you're going to see something that is completely uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, so it's not going to be explainable by a normal mental illness. You always look at the totality of the case. Oppressions to diagnose can be more subtle. Um, but when you look at the complete picture, you know, a good psychiatrist and, and often an experienced exorcist is, is clearly able to discern the pattern of a difference. I want to point out your book um, because you do a good, anybody who's interested in this topic, this is uh, one of the best books I've read on the topic because you really explain a lot of the different cases, demonic foes. My 25 years as a psychiatrist investigating possessions, diabolic attacks, and the paranormal. And you explain very uh, detail in a detailed way some people that thought maybe they were possessed or being harassed by the devil, and they were not at all. 
Also in this book, you told the story of Julia, which is every bit as dramatic as anything anybody's ever heard. Can you share with our viewers what happened in that case? Yeah, first of all, thanks for mentioning the book, because it, it, it does take a kind of book, which a lot of people ask me to write, to really, you know, get into the nitty gritty of how you make these these distinctions. Uh, it can be tricky, but it's very rigorous, and, you know, one can be confident after a while. In terms of uh, dramatic cases that I've seen, uh, I don't know what you said before, uh, Patty, about Julia, but Julia was a very rare uh, Satanist. Uh, not so rare that, you know, they're, they're here and there, but certainly not in every neighborhood even though there was a, a kind of panic about Satanist about 20 years ago. She was the real deal. She was a high priestess, and she was, according to the two exorcists who worked with her and then consulted me, uh, she was the most flamboyant case they'd ever seen, and these were very experienced guys. So one of the kinds of things that, that she exhibited, I mean, even though I didn't see it, I've been to many exorcisms, but not hers, I had about nine people tell me she levitated during the exorcism. She spoke foreign language uh, that she had no way of knowing. But in addition, I, you know, experienced several things being with her. Perhaps the most personally dramatic was uh, our cats went wild one night. This is this is the day I was going to meet her, and then she came. Uh, she came to meet me. And I'd never met the woman before, and she said, how did you like those cats last night? Uh, another time, she could tell me what is obviously a paranormal ability. Uh, we would we would say it's preternatural caused by demonic, not, not sort of loosey-goosey paranormal. She could tell me the details of a priest that she was, uh, one of the priests that, that was going to do the exorcism. She could tell me the details at a distance. Perhaps the spookiest thing is I was talking to her on the phone. I was talking to the exorcist on the phone uh, once, and I had to tell him, look, uh, Father, I can't come to, to witness this exorcism. I've been to many. And and that the voice that I had heard from her in her possessed trance, which she never remembers, by the way, came in over the telephone line, even though we knew she was a thousand miles away. So this is an indication of what I was saying before, that you have to have these hard evidences of something beyond a mental illness. Number one, she didn't have a mental illness. Number two, she exhibited all these paranormal abilities, which she herself knew clearly she didn't have on her own. She was not professing to be some kind of gifted person. She she would acknowledge very openly, I have worshipped Satan, and Satan gives me this ability. So we spoke earlier between ourselves that, you know, most people just see exorcism by what Hollywood offers them. Um, are you consulted by Hollywood screenwriters um, for any, like, realistic information? No, absolutely. I mean, many Hollywood... <laughs> Many Hollywood people have attempted to uh, uh, sort of pick my brain on this on this stuff, and I, I may there may eventually be a movie about Julia. By the way, uh, just because it's it's such a dramatic case, they often you know make the cases uh, a little ludicrous. But their biggest their biggest fault is they make exorcism into magic. You know, if you only find the the right exorcist, he can say the magic prayers to drive out the demon. Now, I, I'm in no way minimizing the role of exorcisms, but I, I think Monsignor Rossetti will agree with me when you ask him that it's a combination. In other words, to be freed of an evil spirit, the person has to work on it themselves. They have to develop their spiritual life. They have to pray. If they don't turn to God, themselves, they're not going to be delivered. And that's what happened with Julia. Remember, Julia was very involved with this cult, and she was scared of the cult, by the way, and she never really fully gave up her involvement of, uh, of the cult. And I used to say to her, Julia, which of course is a pseudonym, I said, Julia, you're not going to be delivered if you don't 
renounce the cult and renounce your sort of uh, info, evil, sinful ways. She refused to do that, and of course she was never delivered despite having these dramatic exorcisms. That's what Hollywood, that's what Hollywood gets wrong the most. Yeah, right. Right, and they make it seem sometimes like it's a war between equals, and really God uh -huh. is superior okay. and is the creator, yeah. but it doesn't, yeah, once you get involved in the occult, it's not always easy to get out. Well, Dr. Gallagher, that went by quickly, especially because we had a little bit cut short, but thank you so much for coming on today. Um, God bless you for the work that you do.